Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Welcome to the Dolly Museum tonight. Tonight we're here for part two of a five-part series called Dolly Condensed. Essentially, this is a program where we've tried to take major points in the docent class, which we teach over a 17-week, four hours a week period, and just slam it all together until we get five hours of good material. So this is your easy, condensed way to bypass going through the dozen class and suffering and writing a lot, and you still get the good bits. Um, that said, of course, a few things are left out. Hopefully, what we're able to do, though, is give you a sense of the vitality of Dolly's career and the changing transitions from period to period. So today, we're going to focus on the period 1925 to 1936. There are many scholars who find this perhaps to be the most interesting period of Dolly's career. I think there's a number of docents and people associated with our museum who would challenge that. But uh, this is kind of the classic period for Dolly. Um, next week, we're going to go into 1936 through about 1948. So Spanish Civil War through Dolly in America. But tonight, we're really talking about Dolly's coming into his own, becoming a master uh, a master of madness. And the first slide to look at very quickly is the residencia. Last week when we were, uh, or I mean last month, when we began the program, we really ended with Dolly's period as a student at the residencia in Madrid. So that's where we're picking up tonight. And the main story here, the main part that really wasn't discussed very thoroughly uh, last time, is Dolly's friendship with uh, Luis Bunuel, the filmmaker, and Federico Garcia Lorca. Uh, the poet and playwright and the person who was deeply attracted to and had a relationship with Dolly of some sort or another. This is a photograph of Dolly surrounded in a kind of literary setting. These five gentlemen are at this point associated with what's called the Generation uh, of 27. Uh, Jose Moreno uh, Vila, Bunuel Lorca, and uh, Jose Rubio Sacristan are just a few of the many figures that were associated with this particular kind of flourishing of literature in Spanish culture, this kind of avant-garde movement. Dali was a visual artist, but he was very closely associated with it and was a writer as well. So it was a period of fermentation, of friendship, of new ideas, and Dali found himself right in the middle of it. It was also through his friendship with particularly Lorca, Lorca that Dali wound up getting a haircut. And if you remember the last, uh, the last way that we left Dolly was long-haired, long sideburns, um, a bit of a difficult sort of um, uh, a dandy, I suppose, but probably one seen much more as a country bumpkin than somebody sophisticated. And it was through his friendship with Lorca and this group of students at the Residencia that Dolly was transformed into a much more elegant, sophisticated, urban-looking individual. And it seemed to, uh, to suit Dolly quite well. This is really where he comes into his greatest sense of self-confidence. And really, the emphasis has to be put on friendships and interactions between key people that are part of, these, uh, part of the group. And Dolly getting feedback. He suddenly has an audience that's excited about what he's doing. So it's a very important time for Dolly's self-confidence. This is also where Dolly has the opportunity, along with a group of students, to all be exposed to Sigmund Freud's writings. And surprisingly, Freud's writings were translated into Spanish in 1924, which proved to be two or three years earlier than it wound up being translated into French. So Dali, Lorca, Bunuel, and their colleagues all had access to this material before um, their colleagues in Paris or other, uh, other areas in London. Uh, it was being translated into Spanish. Dali says that he fell victim to what he called the vice of self-interpretation. So here he is, a student in Madrid, and he found himself so transfixed by Freud's writings that he not only felt the need to analyze his dreams, he also started analyzing slips of the tongue, unusual encounters, um, synchronicity, strange coincidences that would happen. It all became ideas for him to use in his writing and also in his painting. So it's a very important time for the sort of the fermentation of what would eventually be the Surrealist Dali. This is also a period of time of radical exploration. And one of the, I guess, uh, side ventures that Dolly pursued while a student was the development of something called the Putrefax. And the Putrefax were very incidental caricature drawings. If you were to look at these, you would certainly not associate them with Salvador Dali initially. But he grew, he developed an entire 
sort of cadre of these, uh, these drawings with great enthusiasm. And it was something that he shared, an idea he shared with, uh, with the other friends in Madrid. Uh, they would refer to the putrefacts as anybody who was sort of pedestrian, sentimental, nostalgic, boring, in the way, middle of the road, anybody that they deemed themselves to be superior to. And so here we have uh, radicals and socialists seen as putrefactos with this lovely little child off to the side, uh, appearing somewhat like a caricature of Donald himself in a sailor suit. But uh, they were very um, wonderful reimagination, reimaginings of what could be done with caricature studies. And Dali took great relish. At one time, he even talked to Lorca about putting together a book of the putrefacts. They abandoned the project, but it was something that was very near and dear to them. So again, it was a, a student sort of prank, but it was a way to see themselves as superior. It was a way to develop a collaborative language and a kind of shared insider perspective on uh, what was important. One of the things that came out in 1926, which was extremely important, was Lorca's publication, Ode de Salvador Dali. And the ode was basically a very traditional Spanish structure, um, paying homage to a very close friend. And this corresponded with the period of time when their relationship was getting much more steamy, much more involved, um, much more of a, a kind of romantic bent to it. But they became really sort of intertwined psychologically and creatively. So one of the uh, passages, which we have here, is um, O Salvador Dali of the Olive-Colored Voice. I do not praise your halting adolescent uh, brush or your pigments that flirt with your pigment of your times, but I laud your longing for eternity with limits. Sanitary soul, you live upon new marble. You run from the dark jungle of improbable forms. Your fancy reaches only as far as your hands and you enjoy the sonnet of the sea in your window. And that's just one of the stanzas, but it's an absolutely you know, spellbinding um, and very creative uh, celebration of many of the qualities of Dali, including some of the qualities that are best left uh, um, not praised, as he uh, makes sense to, uh, to try to, to point out. But here's this young artist, Salvador Dali, coming towards his graduation. He's already had a successful show in, in Barcelona in 1925. He has another one ready for himself in 1926. He's very close friends with this gentleman who's respected throughout Spain as one of the greatest writers. And then he has the privilege of having an entire book dedicated to him, an ode written about him. So Dali's ego in a pretty good place at this point, <laughs> fair to say. Dali responds with his own written article, which is a really um, fascinating essay, called San Sebastian. And for those of you that are familiar with San Sebastian, he's of course the figure who's martyred at the uh, stake by being pierced by a number of arrows. Over the years, this has been seen very much as a, a homosexual image of, um, of piercing and of uh, penetration. It's often uh, one of the least clad of all of the saints, able to be seen in a much more um, uh, uh, erotic way during the Renaissance and after. And Dali uses this as an opportunity to not only create an essay that deals with his ideas of objectivity and his relationship with Lorca, but he also discusses something rather fascinating and perverse, which is the idea that San Sebastian himself becomes almost like a thermom thermometer of arousal, and that each arrow pierced, the exquisite pain that it produces indicates the amount of arousal so that there's this strange sense of suffering equals erotic um, pleasure. And it becomes much more like a, a machine rather than uh, a, a personal sensation. So this is the idea of the objectivity that Dali uses in his artwork. Uh, Lorca had written to Dali, he said, let us agree that one of man's most uh, beautiful postures is that of San Sebastian. And Dali replies in his essay, uh, in my San Sebastian I remember you and sometimes I think that San Sebastian is you. Let's see whether he turns out to be you. So it, it really is this kind of veiled language back and forth between two gentlemen who are attracted to one another, although Dali certainly not at all comfortable with his sexuality in any sense of the word, whereas, uh, of course, Lorca being much more comfortable and yet very discreet in his own homosexuality. Now we move to the sort of crescendo of Dali's period in uh, Madrid, which is, of course, the graduation. 
Dolly, at this point, as I mentioned, has um, an exhibition already planned at the same uh, place in Barcelona where he had done so well the year before. He's filled with confidence. He has this great friendship with Lorca. His father's dream is about to be realized. His son will have a degree and go out and become a teacher. Dali finds a very deliberate and very explicit way to sabotage this period. What he does is um, he goes into his baccalaureate. There's a group of gentlemen there who are to judge him. He is basically to draw one name of an artist out of a hat and then do an oral presentation. He draws the name Raphael and he turns to the professors and says, Unfortunately, I'm far too familiar with this than any of you. You're inept to judge me, and he walks out. And in that gesture, Dolly loses the opportunity to get a degree from the San Fernando Academy. His father's dreams are crushed, and he moves on, hoping, I believe, to be very much like either Picasso or Moreau, somebody who can make a, lot, a living off their art while not having to worry about the the unpleasantness of having to teach. <laughs> I think that would be the best way to describe uh, Dolly's perspective at this point. Ironically, or perhaps to Dolly's best dream, this happens, but he winds up being drafted for the mandatory uh, uh, military duty, which all students in Spain wind up doing, and he gets some of the lowest level jobs to, that he has to do, latrine duty, uh, peeling potatoes, just really nothing jobs. He never sees any um, any activity in terms of military training. He's just basically a lackey. And he seems to really enjoy this period of drift. He's not really under the control of his father. He's not having to produce any artwork to please anybody. Um, but he's spending a lot of time thinking about what he wants to do next. He's filled with self-confidence. His ego is completely and totally out of control. And I think he likes this fact that at this point he is sort of on the lowest level of the chain but he has great ambition that will soon be realized. So from 1927, he goes through about seven months of uh, doing nothing with the military. And then a really strange blossoming starts to occur. He starts running essays at a great and rapid speed about anti-art. And he falls under the spell of two people in particular. The gentleman on the left-hand side is uh, George de Chirico, an Italian, and the gentleman on the right is Juan Miro. And Last, uh, the last time that we did the Dolly Condensed, I emphasized Picasso as Dolly's great hero. That changes in 1927 and 28, and Dolly embraces a slightly younger figure, father figure, becomes a Juan Miro. Miro is a Catalan, like Dolly is. He's not just Spanish, but he's Catalan, and he's also a member of the Surrealist group. And at this point, 1927, Dolly is becoming quite fascinated by what's happening in Paris. He's reading articles, he's looking at essays, he's looking at book and uh, museum uh, magazines, reviewing current shows. And he's becoming very aware of this Freudian-driven art movement that's happening in Paris, quite far from where he's living. So he's looking at these, these two artists, and on the left-hand side, Kiriko's work influences, him, influences Dali in terms of the way you can create something that's very enigmatic, a kind of um, very powerful statement that seems very dreamlike by having strange shadows, empty arcades, large, um, almost mannequin-like combinations of objects. On the right-hand side, what you learned from Moreau is that you can be very free in the choices you make in terms of uh, creating compositions. And so the next painting that we have from our collection, Apparatus in Hand, is a perfect example of Dali learning uh, from both of these artists and bringing it into his own language. So Dali had mastered realism while he was at school. He also had experimented drastically with cubism. And in this painting, you start to see a very strange combination of both of those languages. Um, we certainly have an apparatus in hand, a somewhat realistic landscape. We can see a horizon line, a sky, some mountains in the background, and what appears to be a beach. And yet the central figure is a strange object that looks much more like it's right out of the Kiriko's work. It's a strange sort of combination of a cone, um, an upside down pyramid, and then this red hand at the very top. This is probably the first example of what becomes known as the great masturbator, the self-portrait of Dali, which we'll see very shortly in a kind of more uh, finished form. But at this point, Dali is putting together these objects to resemble a person in a kind of mechanical form, almost like San Sebastian was a, a mechanical object that measured erotic desire. This is a, a mechanical object that 
stands in for the individual and some of the complex sexual um, anxieties that are going on as a result of the guilt over masturbation. So we have um, these two objects, one on top of the other with the hand on top, but we can see with the shadow over here that it looks to be at least a man-like or robotic type of humanoid shape. There's two legs, a torso, two legs here, torso, head, and then probably an arm holding itself up with a, with a cane. Um, when you look around the object, it's surrounded by different forms such as this bather down here. There's uh, some nude women up here. There's a pair of breasts. There's a nude torso. And there's a decaying donkey over here. Strange combination of things sort of floating. It's very dreamlike, but it's very much moving in the direction that will eventually be Dolly Surrealist style of hand-painted dream photographs. So this is the first major attempt that Dolly is making to paint dreams, drawing on his inspiration from Sigmund Freud, but trying to do it in a way that becomes almost like a symbolic series of, um, of steps. And the first thing to be said is that this hand will eventually become identified almost overnight with a symbol of masturbation. And this stays until 1931. So from 1927 to 31, for almost a four to five year period, Dolly is using the hand over and over again as a stand-in for the idea of masturbation, the pleasure and guilt associated with that. And in this particular painting, the hand is flayed. There's veins that you can see, and there's also these kind of shards of electricity around it. It's, it's definitely not so much a celebration as a, this painful awareness of, um, of this activity. And it stands in for the brain. So it's in the place where the brain and the head would be. So the idea is that this is sort of an onanistic machine driven by all of these female figures out here on the beach. They're all the source of the desire. But then we come to the, the final detail down here, which is the donkey. And I think I have a couple close-ups, and we'll talk about the donkey in one of those. These are, for example, the two bathers, one very beautiful and voluptuous, just a torso, the other a little more strange, a little more cubic, but clearly the kind of woman that one might encounter on the beach, in high heels, no less. <laughs> and, um, and then we come to the donkey, and this is really the sort of sophisticated statement by Dolly. At this point, the donkey is filled with flies, its belly is filled with flies, and there's a, a skeleton, a fish carcass, inside of the head of the donkey, and you can see through the donkey to this uh, uh, blood-like uh, front paw, front leg. And the idea here is there's actually a fish above the donkey. The fish desires, or the donkey desires the fish in the process of reaching up for it. It actually dies and the, the fish kills it. So there's, there's a sense of desire leads to one's own death and termination. And that's, in a sense, the same sort of guilt associated with the desire for the women will lead to sexual contact, which will lead to one's undoing and eventual death. So this is a very classic kind of Freudian yin-yang or catch-22 where there's a sense of desire followed through by death and annihilation. But the donkey, which we'll see again several more times, is a reference to something very, very near and dear to the Catalan intellectual's heart of this period of time. This book, uh, Platero y Yo, or Platero and Myself, was by Juan Ramon Jimenez. It was a story about a, um, um, a farmer and his close companion, this donkey, who always accompanied him into the field when he was do his work. Um, at one point in the story, the donkey passes away, and the relationship was so close that the ghost of the donkey has to come back and occupy time and spend time with the farmer because they were just such joined um, uh, compadres. Dolly knew this book. Dolly found this to be a good example of everything that was horrible about Catalan culture. Mm -hmm. And he proceeds from this point until probably about 1930 to constantly create donkey carcasses. And so every time you see a donkey, the donkey is flayed, it's torn apart, it's filled with flies, it's uh, putrefying. This is Dolly's attack on his Catalan roots. And so it's, a, it's rather sophisticated, and at the same time, once you know that, every time you see the donkey, it becomes clear what, uh, what's being discussed. So, 1928, the stinking ass. This is actually a reference to one of these putrefying donkeys. You can see the donkey shape down here, swarming with flies, it's become a carcass already. And then whatever this is, which I refuse to try to interpret, it's somehow related to that same idea of the donkey, the carcass, the kind of life after death, and um, something I think that's very monstrous and terrifying at the same time. 
Uh, this would be a good example of Dolly's anti-art, and it's an example of the kind of abstraction that Dolly experiments with just prior to joining the Surrealists the following year. The last thing to mention about 1928 is that Dolly joins forces with two of his uh, Catalan friends, um, Montagna and Sebastian Gosch, and they're both writers, and they share Dolly's sort of sense of contempt with the inherited culture that they received. They wanted to be radical, like what was happening in Paris and Germany. They didn't want to be part of the old guard that was associated with the generation of 28. And so they write what's called the Yellow Manifesto. This is it's just a simple broadsheet. And if you look at it, some of the passages are very clear about the things they hate and the things they love. They say, we denounce the lack of absolute youth in our young people. So they find people to already be just carcasses of the old guard, you know, just living in uh, youthful skins. We denounce the absolute lack of decision and daring. We denounce the fear of new facts, of words, of the risk of ridicule. We denounce the lethargy of the rotten atmosphere, the cliques and the personality cults mixed up with art, etc., etc. This goes on for most of the top of the page. And then finally you come to the end and it says, we acclaim the artists of today and the most diverse trends and categories. And this is where Dali clearly is the, the leader of, uh, of this three. And he talks about Picasso and Ozenfant and Juan Gris and de Chirico and Miro, etc., etc. So it's really Dali saying, What's happening in other countries? They've got their modern artists. That's exciting. What's happening here? It's like we're looking to the past. It's time to break, break uh, ourselves from that. And what they do, of course, is they print up hundreds of these, and they just go through the streets of Madrid trying to slap it in the hands of anybody they encounter to basically piss off everyone. <laughs> you know, and they succeed. They really develop this quick reputation of being instigators and radicals and fools and you know, young, uh, young youth gone astray. So this is pretty typical of, uh, of the way artists would, would behave at that period of time. But it also coincides with a very important thing that's, um, that Dolly's friend, Lorca, is working on, which is his collection of gypsy ballads, the Romancero Gitano, published in 1928. These were um, some of the most beautiful poems that he had written, but they were very much in, a, in strong traditional forms. Very, very beautiful, very romantic, very much caught up with the idea of uh, tragedy and death and the, the gypsy life. Dolly, at this point, by 1928, had sort of developed uncomfortable feelings again about Lorca. He was uncomfortable about the relationship. He wasn't quite sure about how he felt about this. And he uses this seemingly as an opportunity to break off this relationship, whatever it has become. And he writes a really scathing criti critique of it. Not an unexpected one, but nevertheless pretty scathing, saying that uh, this is nothing more than you know sentimental tripe. It's like, I can't believe you're spending all your energies on this. There's exciting modern tendencies out there. You're really wasting yourself. And basically just writes a very hostile letter, which becomes about the last thing that they exchange between one another. It's not until 1935 that they see each other again, very briefly over one encounter. And then shortly after that, Lorca winds up dead. So Dolly never really reunites with Lorca. It's all during a very short period of time. They go from being very much involved in each other, almost like two sides of the same coin, to becoming a very difficult, uh, having a very difficult relationship that ends with the Romancero Gitano. However, this provides a very interesting opportunity, which perhaps Luis Bunuel was waiting for to have Dolly fall out of his relationship with Lorca, allowing him to collaborate with Dolly in a very different way. Bunuel definitely recognized the brilliance of Dolly's mind, and he always wanted to work with him. He was himself a very kind of difficult, troubled, and fascinating individual. Um, he was from Zaragoza. His background was very much uh, uh, from a Jesuit school schooling, and so he knew the, the Bible backwards and forwards. He was an atheist, he hated the church, but he loved the rhetoric that he had sort of developed as a student while in school. There was nothing that pleased him more than trying to argue and show the flaws to his uh, priests about their arguments for the belief in uh, God's existence. So he was very smart and at the same time very hostile towards this uh, tradition he inherited. And for a while he was in agriculture, then he shifted to insectology, which I know is not the correct term. And then finally, he spent some time in Paris make, working on a film. 
which is when he realizes that Lorca and Dolly are having this falling out. He quickly finds himself back in Spain, and he immediately contacts Dolly and says, you know, do you want to collaborate on something? Well, what they collaborate on changes everything. It changes their world, it changes the cultural world itself, and it leads to some really new um, beginnings. They were both, as I mentioned, deeply influenced by Sigmund Freud, but the other thing that should be mentioned is they were both of the generation that, that lived with and developed with the beginning of, uh, of cinema. And for both of them, their hero was uh, Buster Keaton. They loved Buster Keaton, the silent film star. They loved the kind of comedy that he represented. They loved the kind of anim anonymity that he embodied, this kind of speechless character caught in the vortex of incredible craziness and yet never losing his composure, never freaking out, and yet always withstanding the most amazing of, uh, of um, torrential you know, and apocalyptic situations. So with these two ideas in mind, they decide to make a movie. And the movie becomes the celebrated film, The Andalusian Dog, Anchean Andalou. And it begins with them sitting down. Each of them had a dream that was very powerful. And they shared it with one another. And they realized that perhaps what they could do is make a film that was based on dreamlike images, but with the understanding that if any of these images could be explained rationally, they would be discarded immediately. They would only work with irrationality. That was exactly what they wanted to make with this film, an irrational eruption in cinema. They also wanted to present, I guess a, uh, what would be the right word? Um, they were reacting against what had become known as the modern avant-garde cinema of the time, which was, um, if you've ever seen uh, Ballet Mechanique, that's a good example. A beautiful film by Ferdinand Leger, but very, um, very much a kind of Cubist movie. There's a great deal of order, and there's a great deal of rhythm, and punctuation, and abstraction, and it's, it's lovely. And that's exactly what they didn't want. They didn't want anything lovely. They didn't want anything that was beautiful, or, you know, or uh, scintillating, or, um, or in any way um, artistic. What they wanted was the viscera. They wanted to pull apart the world. They wanted to reinvent cinema. And so... Essentially, Dolly described the movie as the pure and correct line of conduct of a human who pursues love through wretched humanitarian uh, patriotic ideals and other miserable workings of reality. <laughs> so essentially, it's, it's what's wrong with love. You know, it's what, what is just wretched about the way that we have to interact with one another in relation to romance. Um, Boonwell said that our rule was very simple. No idea or image that might lend itself to rational explanation of any kind would be accepted. We had to open all doors to the irrational and keep only the images that surprised us without trying to explain why. So what they were looking for was a pure eruption of irrationality and a visceral experience in the middle of cinema. The brilliant thing they did is they paced it like a Buster Keaton comedy. And so it was very short, 17 minutes, and yet it was filled with stuff. It was filled with things to discuss, things to wonder about, things that would disturb and, uh, and cause controversy. And of course, the very first image, the celebrated image, is the slicing of a woman's eyeball. Um, you see, and this actually comes from a particular dream that Bunuel had that I'll mention in a minute. There's also a scene with donkey carcasses stuffed in pianos. And we just talked about donkey carcasses and rotting donkeys. Donnelly really enjoyed this part of the, the, the preparation for the film, where he got to take a donkey carcass and make it more carcass-like, uh, doing a little bit of extra eviscerating, and put it using pots of sticky glue to make it look like the, the donkeys were even more glistening. Uh, one of the main things that they did that was very successful and very powerfully influential was they used montage in a very sophisticated and fast way. They would constantly show you an image that would transform into another image. For example, the man's fondling a woman's buttocks and suddenly it becomes her breasts. Um, there's another image where there's a circle of people, suddenly there's a, a circle in a hand, and then there's a um, sea urchin with the same circle. You know, they would do these really quick montage trans, uh, transitions that would create a, a sense of metamorphosis. So that was a powerful technique that they developed. And this is, of course, the, the lead into the scene with the woman's eyeball. This came from one of a uh, of Boonwell's dreams. He said he dreamed of a, a cloud passing over the moon and then a woman's eye being slit. And they actually recreate that here. Of course, they use a, a cow eyeball 
but the camera's so close you can't tell that it's not the woman's eye, and it's absolutely horrifying, as most of you remember. I think many of you have seen this film. Dolly's dream was a, a hand swarming with ants that have hollowed it out. And so here is the scene where there's a man's hand caught in a door, and there's actually an opening, and there's just ants just all over the hand, just swarming through it. And her reaction, the woman to the, uh, to the right, is basically to just stare and to be sort of um, fascinated from afar. You know, not a sense of horror or disgust, but rather just um, a lackadaisical interest. So it's, it's a startling reaction to something that's so provocative. And those are the types of images that fill this movie. This is the famous scene, of course, the hero trying to reach the woman that he's pursuing. He, of course, has to grab these, um, these ropes. The very first item right on the rope is uh, the two um, uh, the tablets from the, the Ten Commandments. So it's that idea of biblical power that's holding you back. And then next to that is uh, there's two figures of priests that are sort of hitched, hitched onto this rope. So it's the, the church itself is a problem. Then there's the two pianos, which represent culture, which also holds us back. And then finally, the stinking carcasses of the donkeys, which is the whole thing, the whole rotten mess, so to speak, <laughs> of our ties to society and proper behavior and family. All these things that hold us back from just being, you know, animalistic in our, uh, our lovemaking. And the, the beauty of it, of course, is that this is Salvador Dali. He gets to be one of the, the priests in this, uh, this little vignette with this kind of surprised look on his face. Um, of course, the title of the movie, The Andalusian Dog, was somewhat understood relatively quickly by the near and dear Federico Garcia Lorca. As a student in Madrid, he was actually Andal Andalusian. And so it was quite often that the, the sophisticated city people of, of Madrid would look down upon people from southern Spain and refer to them as Andalusian dogs. So for Lorca, who's fallen out with Dali, to see his two former friends making a movie and then calling it The Andalusian Dog, it felt very much like he had been slapped in the face in a very bitter way. So this uh, probably was one of the key reasons why there was never a reconciliation until 35. Which moves us to Paris. So Dali has been in Paris now about uh, two to three weeks. He goes in April of 1929. And while he's there, he actually has Joan Miro, his new sort of father figure, act as a chaperone. So his father, Dolly's father, allows him to go to Paris. And this is a really transformative moment. Uh, Miro basically dresses him properly for proper society, and he introduces him to some of the really key people involved with surrealism, including Paul Eluard. So Dolly has suddenly made a great impression, and he's now associated as one of the two creators of this movie that just has revolutionized everything. Everyone seems to have seen Andalusian Dog, and surprisingly, when Bunuel went to the opening, he stuffed his pockets with rocks, thinking he'd have to fight against the audience who would be so outraged. Instead, people were just thrilled and ecstatic and gave it a standing ovation, and it played for the next eight months without ever being uh, you know, changed. So people in France loved the movie. During the same time when Dali was making this and during the month after when he was living in Paris, he paints a painting that is truly remarkable and in every way, shape, and form establishes Dali's surrealist style. And it's the painting from our collection, The First Days of Spring. And it's a painting that appears to be filled with things and yet it's also a wasteland. There's little details everywhere to look at, and yet there's no clouds, no trees, no birds, no greenery. Everything about it is like just emptiness, except for all these little huddles of, of objects. And it's very much uh, seems to be influenced at this point by Hieronymus Bosch. Um, the people, uh, the Spanish princes and uh, kings loved Hieronymus Bosch's very, very strongly Catholic hallucinations. And Dolly certainly had an opportunity while he was in Madrid to spend a lot of time in the Prado and study these works. And the same sense of kind of clustering amazing, strange, bizarre phenomena around the paintings seems to be what Dolly's drawing on when he tries to make his own um, symbolic, dreamlike paintings. One of the images in the painting seems to refer to Sigmund Freud, who might possibly be this guy, um, interacting with this young girl, which leads to all kinds of suppositions, perhaps pedophilia, who knows what's going on. There's also a gentleman who's turned his back to all of these objects who may or may not be Dolly's father, who 
seemingly at this point is becoming much more distant from his son. But there's also a reference to a father and son figure who seem to be very close together. So there's sort of an autobiographical element to this painting that Dolly is creating, even though it seems completely dreamlike and absurd and very bizarre. There's also these two highly uh, suggestive and outright er, um, uh, over-the-top erotically vulgar images. The one on the left having a couple where she's become genitalia. Um, he, his hands are bandaged. He's bound and gagged. And they're placed in front of a postcard of all these people enjoying a holiday on a, beat, on a boat. In a sense, this is the audience the surrealists hate. This is the audience Dolly is trying to react against. And he's trying to create the most horrific visual sexual image that he can and put that on top of this very light bourgeois sort of uh, imagery to, to show this great contrast between the horrors that are in their imagination and the audience that they feel is completely out of touch with anything that's real. And then on the right hand side there seems to be a reference to psychoanalysis but it also seems to be two gentlemen um, you know, engaging in some sort of clothed uh, sexual play. So there is this kind of homosexual element combined with the psychoanalytic uh, element. And then finally, the, the really peculiar shape in the very foreground, right underneath the photo of Salvador Dali as a child, is this sort of exquisite corpse combination of objects. There seems to be a pitcher, a fish, and then what appears to be almost like a haystack with a vein on top of it. It's like the haystack is probably a person's head that has somehow been reshaped and distorted and then the vein has been pulled out of this. And what you can see is that Dolly has written numbers on the vein. And this becomes Dolly, part of Dolly's, I guess, attack on the tools of rational scientific knowledge. So for example, this looks like a thermometer, but we have no idea what it's measuring or how it's to be read. And this is something Dolly does quite often. And he actually had a quote here. He says, I was preoccupied with all systems of weights and measures and numbers appearing everywhere in my work. I was preoccupied with the metric system, with the numerical division of worldly things. And he often uses that sort of obsession to undermine rational understanding inside of a, his paintings. So they really are dreamlike. They don't seem to work even though they look like they could be understood in a scientific way. So not surprisingly, perhaps, this corresponds with an episode in Dolly's life where he was probably very close to madness. What a surprise, right? Um, he is really found himself adrift mentally. He's very un unstable. He starts erupting with laughter at the slightest thing. And that summer, he returns to Kadikez, to his father's summer house, spends some time there, and he invites some of the surrealists to come visit him. So Paul Arlewart comes down. He brings his wife, Gala, which is when Dolly meets her. Uh, Rene Magritte and his wife come, and also one of the gallery owners comes down. So they're all looking to have a good holiday, but also they want to spend a little bit of time checking out and seeing if Dolly is an okay character to be associated with surrealism. So it's, it's a venture to either approve or disapprove of this young new recruit. And it probably couldn't have happened at a worse time because Dolly was starting to see hallucinations everywhere. And this cartoon visualizes some of the hallucinations Dolly described. He would see little owls on people's heads actually sitting on little turds underneath the owls. <laughs> this is the way he described them. And so that would cause this sort of uncontrollable laughter that he was constantly um, you know, erupting in, ir irritating everybody around him. Nobody was uh, finding this to be very enjoyable. And this was also suddenly when he sees Gala, and Gala becomes the obsession of his life. Uh, he says that in 1929, he's on the verge, verge of madness and uncontrollable laughter. And he said, my, la my laughter was not frivolity, it was cataclysm, abyss, and terror. And it's described by a number of people. He was definitely losing it. And this is right when he meets Gala, who's married, she's Russian, she's 10 years older than Dali, she has a young daughter, and yet she's very much involved in a kind of libertarian sexual freedom that's associated with the Surrealist group at this point. She's been living in a menage a trois with Paul Eloard, her husband, and Max Ernst, the other Surrealist painter. She's had dalliances with most of the Surrealist male members, um, members and associates. <laughs> associates with their members, I suppose, would be the best way to say it. She, uh, she found great fun in, uh, in this uh, freedom that was allowed by the group. And it was often described that if a person had done a great 
surrealist work, they would say, ah, he must have been with Gala. So there's a sense of, you know, she had a great power as one of the central muses of the surrealist group. As soon as Dali encountered her, it seems that he knew that she was the person he had to be with. She was the person he had been waiting for. Apparently, the first encounter led to her being completely disgusted and revolted by his appearance. <laughs> if we're to believe his uh, description, he, uh, he had done a number of things to transform himself into what he thought would be beautiful, but actually proved to be hideous, involving goat dung and all kinds of strange things. <laughs> um, perhaps the less said about it, the better. Did some slicing up of himself while trying to shave, and there's blood involved. And So anyway, the second time he appears, I guess, a little more um, appealing. And he does indeed prove to be very persuasive. And at the end of the week, she decides to remain with him and let the other group go back to Paris. And from this moment forward, they are companions. So it's a, it's a remarkably short period of time of their courtship. But she immediately decides that Dolly's the one that she'll be with. She remains there the summer, much to Dolly's father's horror, and um, places Dolly very close to the center of surrealism as a result. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I think Paul Eloir was quite proud to be able to share his wife, you know, to, uh, to show a, a good turn of cheek, so to speak, towards this young lad who had such promise and uh, allow him to, to dally with Gala. But um, it seems that Gala had different uh, objectives in mind. And, Probably this for her was a really good opportunity to move on from her very, very talented, brilliant husband who's not making a lot of money to a potential money-making machine, which is the young Dolly who has these incredible genius type of paintings that could be sold for good prices on the market. So there's a little bit of suspicion about her motives, what's driving her, what drove this relationship. But very clearly, from the rather ambiguous relationship Dolly had with Lorca, suddenly he found a sort of mother-wife companion type of figure all in one with Gala. And he immediately jumped on board and that became sort of the, uh, the train that he was on for the rest of his life. There's also a reference back to Dolly's childhood at this point. Dolly has a story in The Secret Life, not sure if it's true or not, but it's very provocative. He talks about when he was a child, he was introduced by a particular teacher to this optical, like an optical device that had a number of really interesting images. One of the images that just pierced its way into his brain was an image of a young Russian girl in a sleigh being chased by, um, by wolves. And he said, as soon as he met Gala, it's, it's like, this is the woman that I saw many, many, many years ago in this optical theater. And so in his mind, this was kind of a predestined meeting. The Gala became the Russian woman of his uh, childhood mysterious desires. And so here in this particular comic book, which I used last time as well, you can see the com combination in Dolly's mind between the young Russian girl and this new Russian woman who's come to occupy his life as this perfect dream girl. <coughs> Final statement, Gala and Dolly remained together all the way until their, her passing. Some interesting things happened along the way, which we'll be encountering as we move forward in this uh, program. Um, but Dolly, I mean, Gala and her husband, Paul, also remain very close. And there's a whole series of correspondence that continue over several decades where clearly they were still engaged uh, sexually and they were still very much sexual beings for one another. And there's a really um, racy and eye-opening collection of letters called Letters to Gala from Paul to her that reveal just how stormy and how you know really over the top this relationship continued to be long after uh, the marriage to Dolly in 1934. So it's a, it was a very interesting and sort of open relationship that existed at this point. Moving on to a slightly different perspective, by November of 1929, Dolly was a surrealist. He had an exhibition in Paris and the catalog was written by André Breton. So Breton had weighed in and he says, Dolly's art, the most hallucinatory that's ever been produced up until now, constitutes a veritable threat. Absolutely new creatures, visibly malintentioned, are suddenly on the move. So Breton recognizes on the one hand, Dolly is something new and different. There's a lot of artists in the Surrealist group, Dolly is something special. At the same time, he's acknowledging Dolly is someone to not be too comfortable with, that there's some things going on in his work that clearly disturb even Breton. 
And so he's being very upfront about that at the same time. It's a celebration and a kind of warning that he places about this new artist. <clears throat> One of the items that was in this exhibition is this piece. It's called, Sometimes I Spit with Pleasure on My Mother's Portrait. This was a, basically a sketching of the shape of the, um, of the holy, uh, the sacred heart, you know, Christ and blessing. And what's written on it is so disturbing and so strange and crazy that clearly it was Dolly sort of showing his affiliation with this anti-family, anti-nostalgic movement, you know, that he too is against his mother. He too is against family. He probably never in a million years thought that this piece would become, that his father would become aware of this piece. But of course, in Barcelona, there's a, a review of the exhibition and one of the pieces that is central to the review is sometimes I spit with pleasure on my mother's portrait. This, of course, leads to a very, very horrible winter Christmas encounter in 1929 when Dolly's father says, you are such a horrifying embarrassment to this family. You know, we have ceased to, you have ceased to exist for us. And basically he is banished from the family house, which is just quite a remarkable and horrifying thing, but not unexpected to anybody who's followed the sort of trajectory of Dolly's punishing his father over and over and over again. As a result of this, Dolly immediately goes down to Catechez, the family summer house. He stays there for a little while, shaves off all of his hair, and he makes sure that his friend Bunuel takes a photo of him with a sea urchin on his head. So that's what we're seeing here on the right-hand side. This is Dolly, clean shaven, no mustache, sea urchin on his head. And that's what's basically drawn over here. This is not like a Hitler youth or, or Mohawk or anything like that. This is Dolly with a sea urchin. And the idea, which will become clear shortly, is that Dolly is thinking of himself as the son of William Tell. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that momentarily. Very important kind of way that Dolly sees this. Um, it's crazy. It's like, oh my God, you know, at this very horrendous, traumatic moment in his life, he thinks artistically and kind of comes up with this analogy of himself in relation to art. It's, it's pretty crazy, but it's definitely what happened. And we will see very shortly how that manifests itself in his art. He also is told by his father in no uncertain terms, if he's seen, he will be put upon by thugs who will take care of him. You know, I mean, his father is just completely and totally disgusted by his son at this point. You would think that would lead Dolly to go back to Madrid, maybe go to Paris. No, he goes about 15 minutes away from Cadiz and buys a little place over here in Port Legat, so that always and forever he is right next to his father's house on the other a little bay in Cadiz. This is the first uh, little uh, first little hut right here is where Dolly purchases. He purchases these are basically little huts where the fishermen would store their uh, their tackle. Dolly buys one of these little rooms and basically turns it into a small house. Um, and as he makes more money, he buys the next one over from it, and then the next one to that, and then the next one to that. Finally, by 1960, 1970, Dolly has created the amazing villa that we always associate with him. So in 1929, he buys the first part of what would eventually become the Dolly Villa in Port Legat. And by 1930, Dolly is central to surrealism he has become one of these celebrated geniuses of the movement. And so here you have him surrounded by these illustrious stars that we see in every museum. Um, Andre Breton, the leader of the group, Paul Eluard, the great thinker, poet, and also former husband of Gala, Tristan Zara, Max Ernst, Man Ray, Rene Crevel, Yves Tanguy, and Jean Arp. So all of these people, these illustrious characters, Dolly's placed right in the center in this photograph. And probably one of the finest works that he paints that's in this exhibition is The Great Masturbator. This is Dolly's self-portrait. So Dolly, as an artist, chooses to paint in a very large format, because this piece is about four feet across. It's really quite large. Sort of celebrate himself by identifying himself with the very most disgusting and lowly kind of a, um, a sexual association you know, Western culture has been trying to avoid talking about up until this point. You know, he is not just a masturbator, he's the great masturbator. You know, he's very proud of this. And yet, of course, that pride comes with incredible guilt, too. There's uh, a sense of um, loss of self, a sense of fear, a sense of castration, annihilation, 
and ultimate death. So this face that we see here that's so strange, the nose is down here, the eye is shut as if in sleep, this is the chin, the ear would be somewhere back in this area. Mm. You know, out of the face itself, which looks like a big blob of cheese, you have this kind of welling up of all of these associative symbolic images, like the woman who is clearly attracted to this man's prominent genitals, and everything else around just sort of gets aroused at the same time, including the lily over here and the lion's tongue over here. And then we see down here attached to the face a grasshopper. And there's one image that always comes to mind when I see this. If you've ever been falling asleep in Florida in the summer on the side porch and a roach runs across your face, you know the association. It's really, it's a horrific thought. You know, it's the sense of violation. Well, Dolly has attached a, ro a, a grasshopper to the face with ants kind of spilling out as if right in the genital area. So this is a really over-the-top, very disturbing sexual image which has all these provocative associations, but there's things like lacerations across the knee, which according to Freud would be a displaced dream association with castration. You know, it's just the whole layering on that Dolly's able to do with all of these disturbing and very negative associations tied in with Freudian psychology, but creating something that's visually stunning and suggestive and has the kind of power that a Aronimus Bosch has. And the source for this, this is what's interesting. This is a rock from a, from a place called Cape Creus, a little bit further north from uh, Port Legat. This is where Dolly spent a lot of his time growing up. Amazing rock formations are all through the area, and the fishermen had names for them because they would resemble a lion or a horse or a camel. This one in particular was always called the Head of Calero, and this becomes the great masturbator rock in Dolly's imagery. It looks like a nose, a chin, forehead, and it's that same shape we just saw here. So the source for Dolly's own self-portrait is a, a random rock that was looked at in the way that we look at clouds. You know, it just becomes a, a visual conundrum that uh, suggests different types of forms. And this rock and the associations with it appear over and over again in Dolly's work. So one of the works in our collection that was also in this exhibition is The Profanation of the Host. And of course, not only is the surreal, are the Surrealists against uh, family, they're also against church. And so profanation takes, and, and the idea of profanation of the host is the idea of taking the Eucharist, the body of Christ, in a traditional Catholic mass and profaning it somehow, blaspheming the church. And we have a very incredibly strange painting where there's all kinds of things dripping and oozing and growing, and um, it's not quite clear what you're even looking at until you get close. And this becomes almost like a kind of plant-like form, and the blossoms that are coming out on all the sides appear to be these great masturbator heads, these kind of headless or skullless shaping shapes of uh, flesh. And when we look a little bit closer, well, one of the sources of inspiration in addition to the rock is this area. This is called Casa Mila. It's in Barcelona. It's by the great architect Antoni Gaudi. It had fallen very much in disfavor at this point in the 1920s. But it was seen by Dali as being this amazing sort of capturing of a wave in stone. It's sort of this eruption of the fluid, the irrational, the melting and oozing in a kind of solid construct. And it became very influential to Dali. So his own piece seems to melt and ooze around. And on the right-hand side at the very top, there's a gentleman looking somewhat Christ-like because of the beard, unlike the other figures and he seems to be spitting blood upon the Eucharist. So anybody from a Catholic background could see this as being just completely and totally over the top as far as being unacceptable and very blasphemous. So Dolly has already upped the ante, not just showing great masturbators and associating them sexually, but also showing an attack on the church and his own faith. And then on the left-hand side, you have a, a series of faces being uh, eaten at by ants, clustered clustered to or clutched at by uh, grasshoppers, which were a source of fear for Dolly, and then even blood coming from an eye, which is associated with um, Oedipus, the idea of blinding, uh, Oedipus blinding himself. Again, another connection back to Sigmund Freud. And then finally, at the very bottom left-hand side, there's a series of bestial figures engaged in some sort of sexual activity that's not clear. We can tell they're, uh, these figures are all engaged in something. They all seem to be nude. There seems to be something whispering over here, and there's some sort of bestial interaction 
happening between these faces. This also goes back to Dolly's childhood. In Dolly's bedroom when he was growing up, this very beautiful, very typical sort of Art Nouveau illustration hung over his bed. It was just called the font. And if you look at it, there's actually a lion's head right here. And Dolly said that growing up, he always saw that lion's head as a source of kind of fear, that he was slightly terrified by it. When he reads Freud, he finds out that in dreams, you know, um, animals like lions represent bestial desires, the types of things that we try to repress. And he even makes a connection one step further, and he says that in his mind, the lion stands in for his father, the figure who wants to destroy him at this point in his life. So when we go back to this image, these lion heads are no longer just anonymous. They come from Freud, they deal with repressed trees of desires, and they're also a stand-in for the devouring, cannibalizing father. So all of these things are just kind of coming to fruition in Dolly's like, um, imagination that at this point is being kind of filtered through uh, Gala. She's acting as a sounding board. She's making sure that he's painting these images rather than suffering from them psychologically. And there you can see the lion's head, which brings us to the 1931 painting, the one that perhaps is best known by the public, The Persistence of Memory, located in the Museum of Modern Art, except for right now, it's actually it's at the Pompidou. Um, this is perhaps the best known of Dolly's paintings. It's in a way the most uh, remarkable up until this point because it's very tiny. And if you haven't seen it in person, it can be quite surprising. It's only about 12 inches across. And it basically is a very simple painting, which is this empty beach. There's what appears to be one of these great masturbators that's washed up as if it's like a, a, a shell or a skin from something that's lost the, uh, the, the skeleton underneath it. There's a watch over here that's being eaten away by ants. And then there's just three of these flopping, melting, oozing watches. Dolly's story about the origin of this is quite interesting and fortunately illustrated by a cartoon. So uh, brings us back to another great story. Dolly supposedly was painting this work in the summer. It was quite warm. They were going to go with some friends to the theater. The story goes that basically Dolly was starting to have a migraine. So he told Gala to go, go to the theater. He was going to work on the painting that was on his easel. Uh, there was some uh, camembert cheese on the table, which of course has that wonderful runny, oozy, drippy kind of quality to it. And he was looking at the painting, which according to him, and I, again, we don't know if we can trust this as being true, but it's worth at least uh, repeating. He said he was working on the canvas and everything was finished except the watches weren't there. The, the face was there, the, um, the landscape was there, it was very barren. He just didn't know what to do with it. He said out of the corner of his eye, he started to see the camembert cheese resembling a melting watch. And he said, you know, just without even thinking, he immediately thought, that's it. And he records these three melting watches in the canvas. As soon as Gala returns from the theater, he brings her in, sits her in front of the painting, says, you know, do you, looking at this, do you think you would forget this in 10 years? And she said, you know, once you see this painting, you can never forget it. It all sounds very apocryphal. It all sounds very made up. But it's, it's a fun story that does start to talk about camembert cheese and also <laughs> about the kind of way Dolly's mind would work, you know. There's a number of different alternative uh, interpretations as to what the melting watch had to do with. For example, in French, uh, um, melting watch, if you say the word, how is it? It sounds like show your tongue which would look very much like a, sh a watch shape, except it would be um, bending and uh, much more like camembert cheese. So there's a number of, of ways of looking at this, but this is the origin story Dolly shares, and it's certainly worth recounting because of uh, the sense of brilliance that, uh, that Dolly seems to have encountered thanks to the chance uh, witnessing of melting cheese. Which brings us to the second film that Dolly and Boonwell make together. It's called The Age of Gold, they were frustrated by only being able to afford to make a 17-minute movie that was without sound. They basically had records that they were playing with it in the Andalusian Dog. Finally, through a friendship through the Surrealist group, they met the, uh, the Donaye family. The Donaye family were very wealthy, and they agreed to fund it so it could be a full-length movie with sound. Both of them got quite excited about this, but Dolly clearly at this point was distracted <clears throat> by his relationship with Gala. Bunuel, no distractions. He wanted to make the movie. And so they start working together, and it's not quite the same. They don't have the same rhythm that they had the first time. 
they seem really kind of out of sorts with one another. Dali seems to be constantly distracted by Gala and his own sort of um, uh, ideas. But when the final film was made, so many of the images seem to be Dalinian that it's really hard to tell how much or how little involvement Dolly had in the final uh, creation of the movie. Certainly, Boonwell claims that Dolly had almost nothing to do with it. He says that Dolly bailed on him very quickly, that uh, they didn't work well together, and finally he only kept a couple of the images. But there's image after image after image that appears in the film that seems to coincide with Dolly paintings. And so for the longest time, this movie was always thought to be a Boonwell production. And I think only in the last 10 years has there been a real attempt to try to understand Dali's uh, role in it. And it seems like a lot of it is that Dali had the ideas that allowed Boonwell to kind of craft what he did with it. This is a description of some of the things that happen. There's a man's face covered with flies. There's a blind man who's kicked. There's a pseudo documentary about scorpions. There's a clerically garbed skeletons gathered on a uh, rocky cliff. There's a pompous ceremony that's interrupted by a man and a woman who are noisily trying to make love in the mud. Uh, there's guests at a fancy reception who seem to not notice this large farm cart that rolls through the party. There is the most disturbing one of all, which is that there's a survivor of this noted orgy that led to everybody being killed and scalped. And when he emerges, finally, he seems to be like Jesus Christ, you know, the most shocking of all shocking images. However, the pacing of this film was very different than the first one. And for those who watch it recent, who've watched it recently that I've spoken with, there's a sense of really undue torture <laughs> that is part of the experience of just trying to ride it out for the full hour and uh, 20 minutes. It feels longer than it is. And I can't, I can't quite describe why. There are great ideas over and over again. You see them, but it just feels like it needs editing in a very big way. And I think even back then, that must have been the, the case. So here's a few of the scenes, including the Christ-like emerging figure from the, the 120 days of Sodom, the main figure in the movie on the right-hand side, whose eyes at this point seem to have been put out in acknowledgement of Eisenstein's movie, uh, Potemkin. There's also a cow that appears in one uh, bedroom, just randomly. <laughs> Uh, there's the skeletons that appear on the, the coast of Coptocreus. The most salacious image of all is this woman who leans down to suck the toe of a sculpture in a very, very uh, blatant uh, fellatio kind of esque image, just way over the top. Um, but there's a historical uh, story that attaches to this movie that's quite different than the movie itself. The anti, what was it, the anti-Jewish league decided to use the opportunity for the opening of this movie to stage a riot against the leftist dogs, basically, meaning the Surrealists and their associates. And so at the middle of the screening, where there were all these works of art out in the lobby, and this was going to be the great new movie that was funded by the De Noirs, um, suddenly it all erupts into violence, and there's smoke bombs thrown throughout the theater, ink is thrown on the screen, people scream, the police come out, and you would expect the police to side with the people who were violated. But they decide that the film itself is the source of the contempt, and they immediately censor the film. And for the next 50 years, this movie was never seen by anybody again. It was shut down, closed down, removed from any kind of distribution, and mostly destroyed. And it just happened there was one copy that Nancy Kennard, a surrealist, happened to have that got out of the country. But this was never seen publicly again for 50 years. So in terms of its influence, it, aside from the people that were in that theater, it was zil, zilch. There was no influence whatsoever. And just a lot of stories back and forth. What did Dolly do? What did Boonwell do? But the main, you know, the main bottom line is that the people associated with the film were all treated as kind of turncoats to society. And Dolly and Boonwell really never worked together ever again. They left in disgust with one another. There were Accusations back and forth, such as Boonwell taking Dolly's name off of the copies of Andalusian Dog as if it was only Boonwell's film. They, they behave very poorly towards one another. That's perhaps the best way to summarize it. So this was the end of Dolly's Catalan uh, 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 collaborations. This was not at all, though, the end of Dolly's uh, you know, difficulties with his father. We have one particular painting in our collection, The Average Bureaucrat, which captures very well Dolly's relationship with the father-son issues. This figure here is called the average bureaucrat. Dolly's father was a notary. 
certainly a bureaucratic figure. It's not the great bureaucrat, it's the average one. You know, even, even though he's trying to celebrate him in painting, he, he couldn't do the great bureaucrat. This is just the average one. No ears, no sense of watching us, little holes in the head where instead of brain matter, we find little shells and pebbles. You know, certainly this is Dolly showing his contempt to his father uh, very, very straightforwardly. And the interesting thing is, of course, this figure doesn't look very much like Dolly's father. This is Dolly's father here. Sure, he's bald, but he never had this like large, handsome mustache. He didn't really dress this well. He never appeared without dress, I suppose. And what's really interesting is that the figure that Dolly has drawn is related to father figures amongst his other Surrealist colleagues. So this is De Kiriko's father figure. This is Max Ernst's father figure. And this is Dolly's father figure. It's like they're all the same figure. They're just painted by different people. So whenever they want to talk about the father, they use the stand-in figure to, uh, to show this and deal with this. And this is perhaps uh, the, the easiest to understand what Dolly's trying to do with the father figure. Here the father has a son trapped underneath a sewing machine. The head's being pierced while he's eating the flesh off the corpse of the baby. So when Dolly sees the father, he thinks of him as a cannibalizer, someone who wants to eat his son. Uh, he interprets this in relation to William Tell. So here's where we come back to the father-son issue and William Tell. William Tell was the Swiss archer who was able to accept the really inhumane um, uh, quest or whatever um, contest to see if he could win his freedom by shooting an apple off his son's head at 200 paces. Uh, Dolly immediately turns this story into one about infanticide, that the father really wants to destroy the son completely and totally. And then Dolly writes about this and he brings it into a kind of castration myth um, grouping along with figures like Abraham who's told to sacrifice his son Isaac, Saturn who devours his sons, and then even God the Father who sacrifices Jesus Christ on the cross. So all of these father-son relationships where the sons are being destroyed in Dolly's mind, this becomes part of the William Tell story. And so when we start to see these figures over and over again, these kind of bald figures with mustaches, they're always father figures. So, for example, this is a painting in the Pompidou collection called the William Tell of 1930. This is the father figure here, holding a pair of scissors, running at his son. He, of course, has a very, well, I don't know if you can see it, but he has a very clear member dropping out of his shorts. And the son here has his uh, genitals covered by this leaf, hopefully in the final protection before the castration actually occurs. So there's, there's, again, the sense of father wanting to cannibalize and castrate. And, this, and of course, there's a mimicking of the, uh, you know, the Sistine ceiling with the God the Father coming down to touch his, the Adam's hand. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit over the top. I think that's appropriate to say with everything by Dolly, but it is a bit over the top. Um, and then, so this is father-son relationships. Almost within the same period of time, Dolly suddenly latches on one of the most brilliant periods of his career relating to an obsession with this painting by Jean-Francois Millet. It's called The Angelus, and it's a, a beautiful painting about a couple, a peasant couple, giving thanks at the end of the day at 6 o'clock during the ringing of the 6 o'clock church bell, which would be the Angelus bell. When you bow your heads, you say a prayer to God of thanks. And they're, they're peasants. They're basically... Even at the lowliest level, there's a sense of spirituality and a sense of importance. And this painting became universally renowned. And by the turn of the century, by 1900, this was probably the most reproduced painting in the world, even more than the Mona Lisa. And certainly as people became more urban dwelling and more sophisticated, this painting fell out of favor. But by 1900, this was the most reproduced image in the world. And Dolly said that as a child, he would look at this painting which was reproduced in his classroom, and it would be an opportunity for him to daydream. He would look at it, he would think about the images, and he would just let his mind wander. So now he's a member of the Surrealist group, he's in his early, uh, early 20s, late 20s, and he suddenly is starting to have hallucinations of this painting. He said that he's arranging, um, well, he's in the Natural History Museum in Barcelona, looking at dinosaur bones, and suddenly he sees the apparition of the Angelus appear to him amongst the dinosaur bones. It's pretty bizarre. Then he goes on to say that he's walking over a hill at night, at twilight. He's hearing insects as the sun is setting, and suddenly he sees the apparition of the Angelus appear on the horizon. On a third occasion, he says that he's arranging stones in erotic positions on the beach. 
And suddenly, these erotic stones look like the Angelus couple. You know, it's just all these kind of crazy things that he accumulates. And it's through accumulation that Dali starts to develop a really very bizarre understanding of this painting. He feels that there's a reason it's so popular, and he doesn't think it's because it's spiritual and sentimental. And so, inspired by his great hero, Sigmund Freud, he looks to uh, Freud's book that he wrote on Leonardo da Vinci, and Dali starts to accumulate his own sort of uh, Freudian analysis, his own case study about the Angelus painting. And he starts recording a number of experiences that he has with this painting, often through waking dreams and through unusual associations. And he starts collecting objects <laughs> with the Angelus. You know, here we have a coffee grinder, we have a tea, uh, a tea kettle, we have a little um, teacup. We also have postcards. There's hundreds of postcards Dolly collected, including ones that would seemingly have nothing to do with the Angelus. But even though these are mine here, they're standing stones like, um, like in Stonehenge. When you look at them, it's like, yeah, that's kind of like the Angelus couple. That's sort of the pose. He notices these things. He starts collecting these things. There's another one with uh, just some uh, bouquets that are thrown into the space, and yet they look like the Angelus couple. He buys it, puts it in his set. And finally, he reveals what he discovers, which is that the Angelus couple very much has to do with the female figure. It's about a mother figure and also a, a wife figure. And he starts to notice that the female looks rather insect-like. And he says that uh, for Dali, the female figure's posture is symbolic of the exhibitionistic eroticism of a virgin in waiting. The position before the act of aggression, such as that of a praying mantis, prior to her cruel coupling with the male, that will end in his death. <laughs> so if you do ever, I'm, many of you I'm sure are familiar with this, but if ever you have praying mantises and they're in captivity, the female will need to bite the head off the male in order to complete the cycle of fertilization. It's this horrific kind of cannibalization of the male, the sacrifice of the male, for the female's pleasure and the continuation of the species. Dolly finds this to be a very revealing uh, insight into male-female relationships. And so he approaches a painting like the archaeological reminiscence of Malay's Angelus, here you can see the female figure is painted a little more to resemble an insect, and yet both of them are resembling old buildings, like ruins in a landscape. And what Dolly's trying to suggest here is that this re male-female relationship, like the female is destroyer, the female is vampire, the female is succubus, this is the way male and female relationships always exist. And the female is just always out there, the male is always petrified and threatened and afraid and ready to be devoured. Perhaps there's that desire to, you know, to fall into place, but there will be consequences. <laughs> and so I, I don't know if it makes sense in this image, but there are many variations on this image painted. The male's hat is right here in the original painting, basically to show his, um, his uh, um, what's the word? Yeah, so, you know, his, his sense of, um, of being appropriate in, in the eyes of God, you know, to look down, to hide his eyes, to, to stand properly. However, Dolly interprets this as actually the man trying to hide his arousal in order to live longer. You know, so it's like perhaps if she doesn't know he's aroused, they won't couple, he won't be devoured. So that's the relationship here. She's about to devour him. He's trying not to draw her interest. And so forever this seems to be the case because they're ruins. They've always represented this for generations. And down here, there's an image of Dolly and his father looking on to the couple as if his father was introducing them to this idea and saying, you know, this is the way we always have been. This is who we are. Be afraid of women. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this, this sort of fulfilling of the sexual anxiety that Dolly had felt towards the, uh, the painting. Here's another pair of paintings associated with this that show it a little more specifically. In the left-hand side, it's the architectonic Angelus of Malay. The female's on the right-hand side. She has a, a sewing needle that's about to pierce the male. It seems phallic, but it's associated with the female. The male is the big figure over here with the sort of egg-like shape inside of him. And then in the second painting, the atavistic vestiges after the rain, you know, this idea of atavism is something that has been dormant in the species that comes back later. This is sort of the aftermath, where the female has now taken all the life force and the good juicy substances from the male and she now possesses the circular sort of egg-like shape inside of her 
and he's just been left as this little puddle beneath her. So he has been, all of his life force has been drained from uh, this, uh, this female who has devoured him. There's a lot of variations on this. Clearly, there's a lot of black humor. You know, I think humor is, it's important to understand that these are not done under this kind of psychological regime of torture and electrocutions or anything like that. You know, Dolly is giving complete reign to his black humor to take it as far as he can possibly extend it. So there is a sense of, you know, horror, but there's also a sense of this is pretty funny, too. Um, which brings us to Dolly's role in the, in the group by 1934. 1934, there are two leaders within the group. One is Andre Breton, of course. The other is starting to be Dali, and Dali's starting to be a bit of a problem because not only does he have important things to say, he's also doing a lot of things that are embarrassing the group. And I'll show you two of the most horrendous violations within the group that Dali commits. Well, and in one moment, I'll tell you about that. The, the, the first thing to understand, though, is that Dali and Breton have two very different understandings of surrealism. This really summarizes Breton's idea. There exists a certain point in the mind at which life and death, the real and the imagined, cease to be perceived as contradictions. What Breton wanted to surrealism ultimately to be would be a philosophy that would allow us to combine the rational with the irrational, that would allow us to have the waking and the dreaming life together as one, to not repress one in exchange for the other, but rather to have a much more full existence as a person. He really wanted to draw upon dreams, draw upon the irrational, because we had suppressed those for so long. But his ultimate goal was to be a rational, functioning human being, drawing from inspiration from the dreams. Not Dali. <laughs> Dali says that I believe the moment is, hand, is at hand when it will be possible to systematize confusion and contribute to the total discrediting of the world of reality. <laughs> his goal is to amplify the distinction between reality and surreality and to live over there, and to make that be the only thing that matters. He wants to erase the rational, he wants to destroy the rational, he wants to find every way to draw from the rational experience and make that the place where we all live. So there's, there's a disjunction here between the two views of the world. And then we come to this painting. And it's hard to tell, but this painting is actually 13 feet across. It's massive. It's as big as our large canvases upstairs. And it was called The Enigma of William Tell. And William, um, the man whose face we see is Lenin. Lenin was one of the heroes, one of the father figures to the Surrealist movement. The whole Bolshevik revolution in um, Russia inspired Surrealism as an active kind of communal um, opportunity to say what was bad and to try to right wrongs from uh, the past. Dolly has taken that face of their hero and placed it upon what we understand to be this horrendous father figure who devours and cannibalizes. Not only that, Dolly has presented the father figure here in a very embarrassing and compromised way. He has this huge fleshy buttock over here that seems almost phallic, supported by this little crutch. There's some raw meat. There's a silly hat that's become almost phallic as well. All of these kind of drooping and um, impotent type of uh, extremities all gathered around the figure of their hero, William Tell. So for surrealism, this is pretty unacceptable. The next step of it is that this painting was exhibited in a salon exhibition that the surrealists had, from the beginning, deemed as being very bourgeois, very much beneath their own interests and circle. And so essentially what Dolly did is he took this attack on the surrealists and placed it in the most, I guess, pedestrian, anti-surrealist environment possible. So when Breton and his colleagues found out about this, they actually all gathered a bunch of walking canes, and they went to the, the place exhibiting it, and they actually tried to destroy the painting. They tried to uh, bash it in with these canes. It's a little misleading here in the cartoon because apparently the painting was hung too high for them to reach. So despite the fact that they tried to destroy it, they couldn't reach it, and they were quickly you know, thrown out of the, the exhibition hall. But this, was, this pretty much ticked them off you know, in a very fundamental way. The second thing is that at this point, Dolly was starting to write erotic essays concerning uh, Hitler. For him, Hitler suddenly became a character very much like, um, like Nero. He says, I saw Hitler as a masochist obsessed with the idea fixed of starting a war and losing it in heroic style. In a word, he was preparing for one of those uh, gratuitous acts 
which were highly approved of by the Surrealist group. So he was a person who, like Nero, would let Rome burn in order to have this exquisite joy of seeing it all go away. Um, the Surrealists were much more rational and realistic about this. This was not like something to, to play around with. Hitler was not an erotic fetish. He was a very real threat to humanity. And even though this was 1933, a number of things were already in, in motion. And so you know, everybody, even Dolly's closest friends, were very uncomfortable with this new line of um, Dolly's sort of politicalist <laughs> obsessions with uh, sexual deviancy. So in February of 1934, Dolly was called to uh, kind of a, a kangaroo trial where he was basically going to be expelled from the movement. Andre Breton gathered all of the key surrealists there, but he also ske uh, scheduled this at a time when some of Dolly's closest <coughs> allies were actually traveling. So uh, uh, Paul Eluard and Rene Crevel were already out of the country. Um, but Dolly, or Dolly suddenly has to stand up and explain his activities. And he shows up. This is one of those great moments where performance saves Dolly from perhaps um, be, being thought of as a footnote to history. And he shows up with a cold. And he's dressed with several sweaters, a huge jacket, and a thermometer. And as Breton very, very clinically tries to question Dolly about all of his motivations, Dolly will start to answer him with the thermometer in his mouth, spitting as he's trying to pronounce things, being inaudible. People can't understand what he's doing. And he kind of goes through a strip tease, slowly taking off the clothes, turning the whole thing into pantomime, so that everybody there who's very serious and very angry suddenly erupts into laughter. And Dolly erodes the, you know, the tone of the entire uh, event. And finally, Breton freaks out, and he just says, Dolly, how do you explain yourself? Why?" Are you constantly going against us? And Dolly uses the definition of surrealism against them and says, you know, I'm just trying to be true to my dreams, true to the irrational um, side of my, my being, which, as you said, is the only thing that we can uh, take, that we should be doing. We should never censor our imagination. And he says, if I dream of you tonight, Andre Breton, and I am sodomizing you from behind, I will paint it in every glorious detail tomorrow morning because I do not censor my dreams. <laughs> and as a result, in that one act, he sort of steals back from Breton the, uh, the cloak, and he basically finds himself still a, a valuable member of Surrealism for the next four years. So there's a lot of um, concern about Dali. He becomes maybe a lesser central character, but he's still very much an important figure within the movement. In after 1934, but he almost lost the uh, the mantle, and it was just through performance that he uh, he won the day. Shortly after that, 1934 in August, at the end of the summer, he and Gala are actually married in a civil ceremony. Breton, or I mean Paul Eluard, her husband, had been encouraging this for a long time because he was always afraid if something were to happen to Dali, Gala would be left penniless because Dali's father would come in and possibly even take their own um, fortune. So he was very concerned about them, encouraging them until finally, in 1934, they were married. So they had been together for four years at this point. They also cut one of the most elegant and sophisticated of couples in Paris at that time. They were a couple to be seen and photographed and uh, you know, talked to. And in 1934, in November, at the end of the year, Dolly made his first trip to the United States. And it becomes a really important moment in expanding one more time the circles of, uh, of influence that Dolly has, and for a new group of people, a new audience, that suddenly experience this kind of Dalinian um, approach to the world. So they make their, their trip on, um, on the SS Champlain with $500 loaned to them by Picasso, who wanted Dolly to be able to travel. That was about the last time that they ever had any interaction with one another, but they were friends with each other up until this point. And when Dolly arrives here in the United States, he is treated like a king. The, um, the press find out that there's this crazy surrealist coming to the United States, and immediately when they meet him, he has all his paintings tied to his fingers because he says he doesn't want to lose them. And so there's this kind of wackiness about that. And uh, one of the first paintings they see, of course, is this portrait of his wife with a lamb chop on her shoulder. And Dolly says, I love gala, I love lamb chops, why not paint them together? You know, he gives them perfect answers for the perfect questions. And, you know, there's just press out the wazoo. Overnight, he's suddenly an American sensation. And he remains an American sensation almost all the way through the end of the 60s. 
So he really loves America, and America loves Dolly. He's that crazy uncle that they've always been waiting for. And it's during 1934, when he's at the Wandsworth Athenaeum, that Dolly makes the first pronunciation that we all associate with him. The only difference between myself and a madman is that I am not mad. It was said here in America as a way of stating who and what he was. So this is also the same year that he paints one of the great works in our collection, The Weaning of Furniture Nutrition. And the thing about this painting is absolutely stunning. It's a very small canvas, but unlike the number of the images I've shown from the Angelus or from the, um, uh, the William Tell series, this painting is stripped of any of the kind of Freudian psychology or the sexual um, uh, proclivities that some of the other paintings talk about. And it really is about this idea of um, a kind of snapshot of the impossible. It's like a hand-tinted painting that just looks very much like it was done as a photograph. Um, what we see here is exactly what it looks like outside of Dolly's studio, even today, with these terraced hills and the kind of cloud formations. But of course, what we see in the center is a woman supported by a crutch with a large opening in her body. Completely impossible and yet painted in a way on an intimate scale that when you get close to it, almost convinces you of the possibility that this might be real. Um, what Dolly's doing at this point is he's thinking about associations with words and with memories. Um, the woman that we see here, she looks like she's mending a fishing net, which is something Dolly saw every day when he would go outside. Women would stay on the beach, they'd mend the fishing nets while their husbands were out fishing. Um, Dolly's thinking about his, uh, his nanny, the woman who raised him as a child. She was the woman who weaned him from his mother. And he's thinking about that and that idea of the word to wean and to move somebody from one thing to another thing. And so what he's done is he's taken the memory of his nanny and he's weaned it from the past and placed her in the present as if she is mending a fishing net. And then to make that even more explicit, the furniture he associated with her, which is a chest of drawers, which is a bad pun on the idea of a chest of drawers, um, he has weaned it out of her body. He's pulled it out of her body. So there's this idea that the memory is both the objects of the, the room as well as the personality who took care of him. They're both one and the same thing. And so this has come from the past to the present, and then he just pulls it out like a series of Chinese boxes. So here's the opening. There's the chest of drawers that could fit into the opening, and then a little chest with some medicine coming right out of that chest. So it's this fantastic sort of association of words and images that then Dolly creates as if it's a photograph or a snapshot showing us the impossible. These are the women of uh, Port Legat mending fishing nets, just as Dolly saw every day of the, of the week. And then if you go to Paris, the opening windows and in Invalids, the L'Hotel de Invalids in Paris, have bodies with openings inside of them, which are windows. Possibly one of the sources of inspiration for this idea of creating an opening in his nurse's body. And moving close, we're getting very close to the end, just a transition now from the idea of word association to visual conundrum. These are two examples of visual conundrums that would have appealed to Dali very deeply. On the left-hand side, Archimbaldo, who was a painter from the 1500s, he's created a portrait of a gentleman out of the harvest of that particular season. So this is a summer harvest. You can see peaches and pickles and corn and all kinds of things all arranged in such a way so that we see a very particular portrait with a lot of personality for this, uh, this gentleman. On the right hand side we have a double image, a perfect illusion from the past. This is a piece called Paranoia or it's also referred to as Can You See My Wife or My Mother-in-Law? Mm -hmm. And the wife is the, the, I think what most people see first. In this image you can see there's an eyelash and side of a face, sort of an elegant feather, She's turned away from us. She's wearing this like little necklace. Um, very sophisticated, very pretty, very dainty. But if you look at it long enough, you'll start to see there's an old woman with a babushka. And she's got this hag-like nose. She's got two eyes. And this becomes her lips. Real typical, just like classic illusion of two faces simultaneously. Dolly loved this stuff. You know, this is like his, this becomes his meat and potatoes soon. And this is his idea of paranoia. It's the idea that we can go looking for something and we can find it where perhaps nobody else has seen it before. So we move on to what he calls his paranoid critical imagery. And Dolly wrote, writes an article about it. And this particular postcard figures in very importantly in this story. Uh, it's a postcard that's very innocuous, just 
a series of Africans in front of a hut, just a photograph. But Dali said when he was looking, when he picked up this postcard, he was actually looking for a postcard of a Picasso painting of a gentleman's face. And he was so excited by the fact that he found it, even though it was not this postcard, he saw it in this postcard because he was looking for it. So he takes the same postcard over to Andre Breton, and he says, what do you see in this? And Breton, who was obsessed with the writings of uh, the Marquis de Sade, immediately saw the face of de Sade. And in order to kind of see what's happened here, this is the face that Dali was looking for. This is the, pa the face that uh, Breton recognized. And this is what it actually looked like. Two eyes, a nose, and the lips would be right about there. And the idea is, it has nothing to do with either face. But because both of them were obsessed by their own ideas, they found that face within this random uh, collection of figures. And this is the painting that Dolly did of it. It's right there, it's the African hut, and there's the face very clearly. So it's, it's this idea that if you paint it as uh, photographically as possible, perhaps the illusion will suggest the reality of the impossible to allow us to doubt what we see the first time to be the case. Like maybe the world is much weirder than we assume it to be. I think Dali's really trying to spread doubt through paintings like this. He's trying to make us not have confidence in what we assume is reality. And he says, this is a great quote by Dali. It certainly summarizes his position. He says, the fact that I myself, the moment of painting, do not understand my own pictures does not mean that these pictures have no meaning. On the contrary, their meaning is so profound, complex, coherent, and involuntary that it escapes the most simple analysis of logical intuition. Yeah. So he's saying that no matter how ordinary any of his paintings may be, or no matter how simple they may be on first look, keep going back and you'll soon start to unravel the layers of the onion. So it's a way of definitely patting himself on the back. Um, which leads us to almost the end of the talk, which is the fact that in the mid-1930s, Dolly had a very unique arrangement with patrons. He found that uh, it was very difficult to paint the kind of works that he was creating and also earn a living because they would take a little too long. They were very different from Picasso or even some of his Surrealist colleagues. So there was an ingenious arrangement called the Zodiac Group. Um, Gala put it together and it was 12 people who would give a certain sum of money and then each month they would visit Dolly's studio and they could either choose one large painting or a small painting and a couple sketches. And they did this for about three years. By about 1935 to 36, it finally had run its course. And fortunately for Dolly, a benefactor stepped in at just the right moment. And that gentleman was Edward James. And this is him with Dolly and Gala in Rome in 1935. On the, the right-hand side, there's an image that many of you may recognize. It's a great painting by Magritte of him. He's the gentleman who doesn't show any reflection. The... Um, inadequate or um, uh, introduced uh, reproduction. So it's Edward James looking at the back of Edward James and Fury continually looking at the back without seeing the front. Dolly had a really powerful relationship with him. For the next three years, he has a contract where he pays Dolly a monthly allowance. And every month, most of the work that Dolly creates is owned by Edward James. And he amassed one of the most remarkable collections which will be a big source of next month's conversation. Next month, we'll start with 1936 and look at some of the most sophisticated and really spectacular double and multiple image paintings Dolly ever created. Dolly also helped him to decorate his house in Moncton. So we have the lip sofa over here on the right hand side, so on the left hand side, and we have the armchair on the right. <laughs> We also have the lobster telephone, which was created for, um, for him. The lobster telephone, which I always think, in my mind, and I could be completely incorrect, but to me this really seems like a tip of the hat to Vincent Van Gogh. Um, Van Gogh, of course, the mad artist of the 19th century, slices off part of his earlobe to show his love. Here in the 20th century, we have the mad artist of the 20th century creating a, a machine-like object that, if it was real, would actually very easily accompany us to do the same thing with lobbing off part of our earlobe. So it seems very much like a, an acknowledgement of this kind of madness. Dali also was starting to create objects, and that's going to also lead to the discussion of fashion next month. This is uh, similar to the Weaning of Furniture and Nutrition. Here we really do have a chest of drawers. Um, this is the Venus de Milo with drawers, or pom-poms. 
And Dali said that uh, Freud was always wanting to analyze the, the deeper psychology underneath the skin. He provided drawers so we could reach in much easier and get access to it. <laughs> And of course, it's the Venus de Milo, the most beautiful of Western figures. So the idea here also has to do with beauty and hidden secrets and mysteries and all things that can be revealed from within. And the final thing just to mention about this is when Dolly created it, he had Marcel Duchamp's assistance. And even though it looks like just a plaster cast that he cut these holes into, it's actually it's a bronze piece that then is painted to look like it's plaster. So there's the final element of surprise that if you were to lift it, you would probably get a hernia. <laughs> 1936, um, thanks to um, Edward James, Dolly finally travels to uh, London. He does, he's part of an exhibition there and he becomes a sensation. And it's another one of these performative moments where Dolly is transformed and becomes sort of a heroic figure despite himself. Um, here he is in a diving suit surrounded by a number of his colleagues, including Man Re I mean, Paul Eloir. And, uh, Actually, I don't see him in here, but I know Edward James was the one instigating this. But the idea, um, if you were at last month's lecture, you found that Dolly was completely and totally obsessed by um, Narcisse Montpurial, the inventor of the submarine who was a Catalan. Um, he always liked the idea that, uh, you know, that Montpurial was the one who dived into the un unknown and was able to be one of the first people there. Here, Dolly wanted to demonstrate the same idea, to show him as like, the sea, deep sea diver of Freudian psychology, diving into the depths and bringing back the treasures of the unknown. So it was a very, you know, kind of um, um, clear example, like a metaphor in the way that he presents himself. And once again, we look to a cartoon to understand what happened, because according to the story, when they sealed the, uh, the, the glass window, Dolly proceeded to start to give his, his talk, his demonstration, and someone had actually closed the door behind him on the air tube. And so as he starts to try to express his ideas about surrealism, he starts to suffocate. And as he realizes that there's not a lot of air and he can't quite be understood, he starts to flail about. And initially everybody thought that was part of the performance. And Dolly becomes, they, they give him an ovation, they you know, are howling, it's like this is all great fun. And it was only, I think, when Gala realized that Dolly's face was starting to change color that they, they finally found a way to get him out of this and rescue him. And here's the Dolly who almost dies to become the great deep sea diver. But as a result, again, in the London Times the next day, long articles about the great performance of the amazing, you know, surrealist maestro from, from Catalonia. So overnight, you know, Dolly becomes a sensation once again. And we'll see that several more times. So I'm going to end with 1936 and, of course, the beginning of the Spanish Civil War that summer breaking out really becomes a very different period for Dolly's career. And the other thing from 1936 is that in December, Dolly winds up on the cover of Time magazine. And that is when suddenly Dolly comes, changes from becoming a local talent recognized throughout Paris to becoming an international talent recognized anywhere that he goes. He had no idea about how powerful Time magazine was and how many people read it. And overnight, in 1936 at the end of it, Dolly becomes just a sensation that every house from east to west coast in the United States is aware of and talking about. Sort of like the Adams Family, the way that we think about the Adams Family, that's Dolly for, uh, for the public. So I hope you'll be able to join us next month. We're gonna do Dolly Condensed Part Three, which will be about, um, um, about the 1936 to 1948 period. We'll talk about the Spanish Civil War and what Dolly was doing during that period. Talk about the Dream of Venus Pavilion at the World's Fair his exile in America from 1940 to 48, his working on The Secret Life, which is the amazing biography he wrote, autobiography, his work with Hitchcock, Disney, and the Marx Brothers, and finally, his whole sort of opening up to the world of commercialism. So a lot of things planned for next month. Um, hope you enjoyed tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Yeah.